going through this teaching series in, in children's ministry, and I've, I, I titled it, and maybe your kids have told you, but I've titled it Walking with Jesus to the Cross. And um, I figured today we would just continue that message. This will be the fourth installment of a, of a book study that we've been in in the book of Matthew. Uh, we've gone through basically every main event in Jesus' life as he gets to the cross. So we've gone through his birth, his baptism, his temptation. We've gone through his teachings and, and his miracles. And today we find ourselves in Matthew 17 for yet another event. The transfiguration, by the way, I don't think I introduced myself. My name is, is Dylan. I am, the, I am your children's pastor. Um, we don't mess around in, in children's ministry. You know, they teach all sorts of stuff in the public school system. And then we get to Sunday and we think we have to dumb it down or water it down, but we don't do that. And so today, even in family service, I'm going to preach the word. <laughs> Jesus, you know, was found when he was 12 years old sitting under the scribes in a synagogue, but we just pawn off our kids on Sunday and expect them to, you know, to get taught, which they do here at, at, at this church, but we're, we're, we're different here. We go all in at Hope Family Church. So if you have your Bible with you, go ahead and turn to, we're going to start in Matthew 16, actually. We'll start in verse 21. It should be up there on the screen. <clears throat> I love the sound of flipping pages. It's the best. Peter, if you remember just a chapter before, makes his confession about Jesus. So everyone's wondering who this Jesus character is. You know, some say he's a prophet. Or he's, some say he's a teacher. Some say he's a good man. And so he asks his disciples, who do you say that I am? And to the astonishment of everyone, and I say that sarcastically because Peter was known to jump the gun, he says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And not even a few verses after Verse 16, 21, Jesus begins to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things. Suffer many things? What's he talking about here? This confused the disciples. How could Jesus be the Christ, the son of the living God, if he can suffer at the hands of some measly men? So if you remember, you know, Peter's bright idea was to take Jesus aside. And so Starting in verse 23, he began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned to Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your minds on the things of God, but on the things of man. Mind you, this is just moments after Jesus made his grand confession. He, I mean, he was feeling himself. And now he's Satan? <laughs> What's interesting about this moment in Scripture is that Jesus got, uh, just got done telling his disciples that Peter's confession was going to be the rock upon which he was going to build his church and that the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So I sympathize with Peter. You know, it's kind of hard to understand why Jesus has to go off and die. You know, everyone's expecting this warrior king to lead them into battle against all their enemies. And if I'm being honest, I wouldn't mind that. I mean, for years, the church has been on the sidelines, on the defense, always on the back foot. But Jesus told his disciples that the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. What people don't understand is that the gates of hell are not on the offense. They are a defensive position. Something else is on the offense. Something else is on the move. So if you remember back in Matthew 4.10, Jesus is led up to the wilderness and three times Satan tempts Jesus to take the passive position, to avoid the cross. And so Jesus tells Satan to get behind me. So Jesus recognizes in Peter's words that same diabolically inspired temptation to take the passive position and avoid the cross, to take the easy way out. But Jesus is not on the defense. He's on the offense. Just not the way Peter and the disciples thought. So this kind of troubled them. So Jesus does something so rare that he's never done before in the history of the New Testament. He moves their faith to sight. He says in the last chapter of, in the last verse of chapter 16, truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the man, son of man coming in his kingdom. He says, Peter, I, 
I heard who you say I am, and now I'm going to show you. So if you're taking notes, we're going to look at three things that Jesus shows us in his transfiguration, which is chapter 17. Three things. The first thing is say the, the Savior's glory. The Savior's glory. <clears throat> so let's pick it up in chapter 17. Y'all ready? I feel like I've got the kids' attention right now. This is good. We've got five minutes. <laughs> All right. Verse 1, and after six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, his brother, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. Luke's gospel actually says they went there to pray. I mean, I, I can only imagine, you know, what about, but perhaps it has something to do with all this suffering many things business. And so the Bible says while Jesus was praying, verse 2, he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun. His clothes became as white as light. That word transfigured is a Greek word. It's metamorphosis. It's a combination of two, meta and morphe, and it literally means to transform. We see this in Romans 12, to be transformed, metamorphosis, by the renewing of your mind, not to be conformed to the world, but to be transformed. 2 Corinthians 3.18, and we all with unveiled faces, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed, metamorphosis, into the same image from one degree of glory to another. So, so something miraculous is happening. Hey, thank you, Sammy. I've got one hand. <laughs> Obviously, Jesus' nature didn't change. We know that he's God, but his appearance is changing. The Bible says, like light. I mean, these were Jewish men. I mean, they knew from their Bible that when God shows up in the Old Testament, he appears as light, a bright light. If you remember thousands of years before this event, Moses ascends Mount Sinai, and he's in the presence of the Lord. And when he comes down, the Bible says his face shone like the sun. We know from, from Scripture, from Sunday school, that this wasn't a glory that came from Moses. It was only a reflection of God. The difference between the light of Moses on Mount Sinai and the, mount, and the light of Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration was that this was the light of God himself. This was not a reflection. This, it, it's a narrant. It's a glory outside it's not a glory outside of him it's a glory within him the bible calls it the kavod isaiah 42 8 that said this is a glory he shares with nobody this is this is something only available to jesus john 17 jesus praying for his disciples in the upper room this is the night before his trial and he says father glorify me in your own presence with the glory that i had with you before the world existed. This was a glory that he had before the world. John 1, 5. <clears throat> he couldn't, John, who's here at, on the Mount of Transfiguration, couldn't even help himself starting his gospel without saying this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. We'll skip ahead. And in him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and, his, and the darkness has not overcome it. This was an overwhelming light. It's not just the light of some teacher or some, you know, good man. This was the light of God himself. This was the Savior's glory. The second thing we see is the Savior's purpose. So he was transfigured before them. Now, mind you, all this is happening while the disciples are asleep, no doubt. If you remember in Luke twenty two forty five, 45, Jesus is praying in the garden and he's sweating. He says that he's sweating blood and he comes back and he finds his disciples asleep. <laughs> same thing they're doing here. Luke actually tells us in that same chapter that they were asleep from sorrow. Interesting. I mean, who can blame them? Jesus keeps telling them he's got to go off and die. But that's what sorrow does, doesn't it? Makes you want to curl up in a ball, sleep escape from the world the bible says hope deferred makes the heart sick i can only imagine that there was some deferred hope now none of you guys are like the disciples you know none of you guys have hope that sometimes is deferred none of you guys feel like you know maybe the world's caving in on you you know but while they were asleep he was transfigured before them and luke tells us that this glory was so bright 
It woke them from their sleep. Let me tell you something. If you're tired, if you're weary, if you feel like you've lost all hope, all it takes to be awoken from your sorrow, to rise from your shallow grave, is to see the glory of the grace of God in Christ Jesus himself. All it takes is a moment. Isaiah 61, arise, O sleeper, for your light has come. It's, it's not one day coming. It has come already. And the glory, for the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. If you're looking for answers in anything other than Jesus, let me tell you this morning, you're missing it. Come to me, all who labor and are weary, and I will give you rest. So when they awoke, verse 3, behold, there appeared to him Moses and Elijah, and they were talking with Jesus. Luke tells us that they were talking about his departure, which is just an, another word for the cross. The thing that the enemy has been trying to get Jesus to avoid. <clears throat> that scandal of grace. Wait, so you mean to tell me that Moses and Elijah were aware of the cross? Didn't Moses write the Old Testament? Didn't he write the law? You know, don't they, aren't they like different? You know, I, I love when people say that, yeah, well, Dylan, we're saved by grace, but we've got to live by the law. Oh, really? Right here, here's Moses who represents the entirety of the law, and you have Elijah who represents the entirety of the prophets, and they're in full agreement with the grace of God. They're talking about the cross. They're like getting excited about it. This is the redemptive plan of grace. Jesus is the scarlet thread, as we'll see throughout the entire Bible. He's the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. The cross has always been plan A, and Elijah and Moses even knew about it. <laughs> the Pharisees missed it. Elijah and Moses, they, they were going to be there at that moment. I ain't missing this. So we pick it up in verse 4. Peter said to Jesus, <laughs> of course, you know, because it's Peter. You know, it's funny, just a side note. I feel like, I, I, like I'm like Peter. I feel like I say things and I get myself into trouble, you know. It's <laughs> so Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good that we're here. If you wish, you know, I can make three tents, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. <laughs> he hasn't learned his lesson, has he? The Bible says he was still speaking when, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud says, this is my son with whom I'm well pleased. This is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. We learned this in, in children's ministry um, two, two weeks ago. If you guys remember, Jesus is baptized, you know, and he comes up from the water and a voice from the cloud says, this is my son with whom I'm well pleased. But here he's not just the son of God. He's the beloved son of God. Luke, Luke adds, my chosen one. So who can blame Peter for wanting to interrupt a good conversation, you know? He just wants to bask in it. Forget the suffering, Jesus. Let's stay here a while. But as if, God, he, as if he didn't learn the first time, you know, get behind me, Satan. Now he's got God himself telling him to shut up and listen. <laughs> I mean, God, oh, just uh, listen to him. Listen to what? Listen to what Jesus has to say about his death. Keep your eyes on the cross. Keep your eyes on Jesus. This was the Savior's purpose. There's no avoiding it. He's going there, whether you like it or not. The cross was always the plan. Verse 6. And when the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were terrified. But Jesus came and touched them. Rise and have no fear. And when they lifted their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. And as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus commanded them, Tell no one the vision until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. Mark tells us that they kept this matter to themselves, pondering what the raising of the dead meant, pondering what all this suffering business meant. If you remember back in Luke 2, uh, an angel of the Lord appears to some shepherds in the night. And it says, The glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with awe and great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not. For behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you this day, in the city of David, 
is born a Savior. And so they set off and they go to the place where Jesus was born and they encounter Mary and they tell Mary all this stuff that they just heard. I mean, the Bible describes that a choir of angels appeared and they're all saying that her son, who hasn't even been born yet, is going to be the Savior of the world. You know what the Bible says? Luke 2, 19, Mary treasured up these things, pondering them in her heart. It's one of the most profound pieces of scripture, and here the disciples are doing the same. It, I mean, it's, it's a lot to take in. This was the Savior's purpose, the sinless, spotless lamb in our place. The last thing we're going to look at this morning is the Savior's message the Savior's message. This all right? Yeah? At the beginning, um, y'all wrote as a family what you thought your idea of the entire Bible was. You know, if you could sum up the Bible in one word or one phrase, this is, this is, what, this is what it's going to be. And so I'm just going to read a few. None of them are wrong, by the way. None of them. They're all right. I just wanted to highlight, I, I want to highlight in my message something that I, I, I have seen, okay? So trust, grace, this too shall pass. I like that. Mm. If you believe, promises will be fulfilled. Mm. I like it. Grace. Grace wrote that again. Hope, okay? I'll read a few more. Grace again. Amen. God's love. Great. Love. I think we're getting a, a good theme here. Grace, grace. Okay. Double grace. So I'm not sure if you knew. Um, I think maybe Pastor Ken mentioned it, but um, I read the Bible in, in 30 days. Okay. <laughs> And it was, it was quite the feat. If you know anything about me, I'm not much of a reader. It must be my hog wallet blood or something. I just, I, I just don't read. But as I've gotten older, I've sort of picked up reading. And, you know, this year I set out to read the Bible in 30 days. And last year what hurt me is I just, I got, you know, caught up taking a lot of notes. And if you're going to try to read the Bible in 30 days, you can't be taking notes. <clears throat> and so this year I did my best and I did it. And, um. I, I notice something. Matthew 17, 7 to 8, rise and have no fear. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. This, this theme, rise, have no fear, rise, have no fear, it just kept like popping up at me as I'm reading throughout the Bible. You know, especially in the uh, major and minor prophets, you know, it would start off by saying how bad the Israelites were and how messed up they are and there's impending doom and impending judgment. You've got to pay for your sins. And then in the last few chapters, it's like, but hang on, I've got a plan. Don't worry, don't fear, I've got a plan. Right in the beginning of the Bible, Adam and Eve, you know, they, they sin and they're separated from God, so we're told. And right there in the midst of the garden, God clothes them with grace. Genesis 3.15, what's called the proto-evangelium, big word for all those kids because they're going to remember that. The first gospel, God says to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between you and your offspring and your off he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So throughout the Bible, we're waiting for this seed to come, right? And you have these dispensations of the gospel. God makes a covenant with Abraham in Genesis 15 that he will make him a nation as numerous as the stars. He tells them in verse one, fear not. Abraham, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. And in Genesis 26, God reminds Isaac of the covenant that he made with his father Abraham. He says, I am the God of your father Abraham. Fear not, for I am with you. You've got Moses, the greatest leader of all time, here on the Mount of Transfiguration. You know, he led Israel out of bondage. You know, he's got Egypt on his heels and he's about to cross the Red Sea and he looks back and he says, fear not, stand firm and see the salvation of the Lord 
which he will work out for you today. After that generation passes away, they spend 40 years in, in the wilderness wandering. God tells Joshua as he's about to lead the people into the promised land, have I not commanded you? Be strong, be courageous, do not be afraid, nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. PK preached on Ruth last week, and as he's about to, uh, Boaz is about to redeem her of her estate, he says, do not fear. I will do all that you ask. I can go on, 2 Kings 6.16, Elijah surrounded by an enemy, far too great that his partner can't see, shaking in his boots, and he tells him, don't be afraid. For those who are with us are more than those who are with them. David's last words to his son as he's about to succeed him as king with the responsibility of building the temple tells him, be strong, be courageous, do it. Do not be afraid nor be dismayed for the Lord your God, even my God, is with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. Isaiah 41.10, fear not. For I am with you. Be not dismayed. I'm your God. Jeremiah 1 8. Do not be afraid. I am with you, declares the Lord. Daniel 10 19. O man, greatly loved, fear not. I mean, I can go on and on and on. Throughout the entire Bible, the message remains the same. Fear not. I am with you. And so we fast forward to the New Testament. Everyone's in, in, in anticipation of a Savior. And the Bible says in Matthew 1 that Jesus is born and that they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Fear not, nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God, Emmanuel, is with you. This is the message of our Savior. You might be like the disciples. You feel like you've lost all hope. Can I remind you? He is with you. (laughs) He's with you. The Bible says a thousand may fall at your side, 10,000 at your right, but it shall not come near you. The Lord your God is with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. And I'll end with this. Peter, after witnessing every miracle, being there at the transfiguration in Jesus' inner circle, he would soon see the triumphal entry, which is next Sunday, which is why I wanted to preach on the transfiguration because we're walking with Jesus to the cross. This is the next step. If if you know his story, you know he denies Christ three times to a little servant girl of of all people. He flees the scene of the cross. The only disciple that was there was John. You all know the story, but you know what's interesting about all the ups and downs. Maybe you feel like you've made too many mistakes or that you're too far gone or you're too old. All the ups and downs. The betrayal, being called Satan, God himself telling him to shut his mouth. There was still grace. There was still grace. The Bible says where sin abounds, grace abounds even more. Even more. So Peter knew a little something about this grace of God. He was a product of it. He preached his first sermon on it on the day of Pentecost, the day 3,000 people got saved. So I'll end with this. This is Peter in, in his second letter, chapter 1. For we do not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son with whom I'm well pleased, We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven. For we were with him on that holy mountain. And we have the more prophetic word, more fully confirmed, to which you will do well to pay attention to, a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Friends, today is that day day we have a more prophetic word and his name is Jesus Christ he surpasses the law he surpasses the prophets he is the fulfillment of everything that was spoken in the Old Testament and he is alive today the glory the kavod which he shared with nobody now lives in you Christ the hope never deferred glory is in us 
Amen? Amen. Man, I knew I was excited to preach. (laughs) How'd y'all do, kids? Did y'all learn a lot? (laughs) I always tell the kids after I, I end my message, hey, if your parents ask you what you learned today, this is what you're gonna tell them. You know, because I tend to teach when I preach. You know, there's a lot of information. So I'm gonna do the same thing. You know, when your friends ask you what you learned on on Sunday, (laughs) God is with you. The entire Bible, yes, there's grace. Yes, there's hope. Yes, there's grace, grace, more than enough. But he is with you. From Genesis to gospel, he is with you. He's the scarlet thread of your family, of your future, of your, of every hope that you have and every dream. Amen? Man. Man, God is good. <clears throat> well, let me pray. We've got, um, I think we've got a few more things that we want to do as we leave. But Heavenly Father, thank you for who you are. Thank you for the everlasting love displayed in Christ. Redemption accomplished in your son's cross. Thank you for the application of that cross through the Holy Spirit that we are not just believers, but we are empowered disciples to make a difference here on this earth. I pray that fear, that drowsiness, that whatever bondage is held on anybody in this room or in these walls beyond that you'd break it with the glory of your grace thank you Jesus for being our God Emmanuel with us in every single moment and the church said amen 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 love you guys